Few people, other than students of military history, would know of the Battle of Kursk, and yet undoubtedly this battle of epic proportions between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union deserves to be considered as the most important battle of the Second World War, if not of all wars in history. The sheer numbers of men, tanks, guns and aircraft involved were on a scale without precedent. Losses on both sides, both in terms of men and machinery, were colossal. More than 6,000 tanks and over 2 million men clashed there, and the Russians for the first time put a halt to a German blitzkrieg. The build-up for the attack on Kursk had taken three months. The battle lasted only two weeks. By the end, Germany had lost the initiative, never to regain it. Codenamed Citadel, the Battle of Kursk was the largest clash in the history of the world, and possibly the most decisive battle of World War II. Vast armies on both sides were engaged. Never before had there been such a massive force assembled of men and armor. And over the battlefields and the war in the skies, one of history's most costliest single days of aerial combat ever recorded took place. The battle of these titan forces unleashed armored and aerial clashes of unprecedented scale and ferocity as both the Russian and German forces confronted each other in this mammoth fight. This was the last great German offensive on the Eastern Front, and in effect, Hitler's last great gamble before the war in the East was irrevocably lost. Its aim was to claw back the strategic initiative from the Russians after the surrender of the Sixth Army at Stalingrad, ultimately turning the course of the war in favor of Germany. Coupled with the British victory at El Alamein in North Africa and the Anglo-American landings in French Northwest Africa, which coincided with the Stalingrad disaster, the tide seemed to have turned fully against Germany and her allies. The Wehrmacht had lost a great deal of its aura of invincibility as a result of the recent defeats. Hitler desperately needed a victory to win back the respect and morale of the German nation. The location chosen by Hitler for this titanic battle was the Kursk salient in the heartland of the Ukraine. No effort was to be spared. This was to be an all-out attack on the Russian defenses. The salient was 255 kilometers across, jutting like a fist into the German front line. It extended from the north of Kharkov to Oral, near to the industrial city of Kursk. This is the story of that battle. Following the massive defeat at Stalingrad, within four hours of his defiant message to Hitler, Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus on the 31st of January 1943 surrendered his Sixth Army to the Russians. Hitler had expected Paulus to take either the option of suicide or a fight to the death to the last man rather than capitulate. Paulus refused. No German field marshal had ever surrendered, and Paulus was now a bitter and disillusioned man. During the early months of 1943, despite the many setbacks and disasters, the German army didn't lose its determination. The soldiers continued to fight on regardless. In fact, the German general von Manstein and his army group had halted the Russian advance after Stalingrad and had driven it back at least part of the way. By the end of March, the situation had once again stabilized, Kharkov and Stalino falling back into German hands. Unlike many of his generals, Hitler, however, believed that limited attacks would serve as a morale-boosting exercise to the German people. 
By the April of 1943, with the arrival of the Spring Thaw, the fighting began to die down, and the German army in the Eastern Front now faced a bitter choice between inaction, which would surrender the initiative to the Soviets, or for further offensive operations, with its strength badly weakened by the Russian offensives of the previous winter. Kursk, however, remained in the Soviet grasp, and around the city, a great salient bulged into the German line. In the end, politics decided the issue. Germany could not be seen to falter. It must remain on the attack. Hitler could not bear the humiliation of defeat. In an operation codenamed Citadel, Hitler and his generals chose to attack the deep salient in the region of Kursk that had been left by Field Marshal Erich von Manstein's mobile defense of the previous winter. Hitler promised his generals the most up-to-date equipment and vast numbers of men for Citadel, and during the months of April, May and June, the endless supply of troops and equipment poured in towards the Kursk salient. As the supply trains rumbled across the Russian countryside, the factories in Germany were hard at work producing new weapons. Production was stepped up, double of the number of tanks were coming off the assembly line. There were new models, high-powered, heavier guns, and more thickly armoured than Panther Mark V and Tiger Mark IV. The best that Germany could produce. In the event, production difficulties held up deliveries of the new Panther, but still reinforcements of the other types poured in. Uncharacteristically, Hitler had misgivings about Citadel, admitting that his stomach turned over at the mere thought of it. Indeed, a shortage of armor made him postpone the operation three times in April, May and June, giving the Russians vital opportunity to prepare their defenses. By the end of June, the two German army groups in the north and south had almost a million men available for the operation. In support, 10,000 artillery guns, 2,700 armored fighting vehicles, and two Luftwaffe air fleets with more than 1,800 operational combat aircraft. The Germans planned to destroy the salient with an overwhelming blitzkrieg style pincer operation. The 9th Army under General Walter Modell would attack from the north, while General Hermann Hoth's 4th Panzer Army would strike the southern side of the salient. The two armies would meet east of Kursk, cutting off all Russian forces to the west of them. Martin Langer was the driver of one of those last tanks to arrive. Ja, ich bin in Sagan beim Panzer 15 ausgebildet worden ab 42 und hatte das Glück. I was trained in the Saarland Tank Unit 15 and in 1942 I was lucky to be trained from January to March at the School for Motors at Wunsdorf. Und nach meiner Rückkehr after my return to Saarland to my unit, I got my marching orders. Three or four days later we arrived. The unit was supposed to be there. Da lag angeblich die Abteilung. Und wo wir hinkamen, war die Abteilung schon in Grafenwöhr. Also sind wir nachgereist. Und da when we arrived, they were already in Grafenwöhr, and we had to travel after them. The first Panthers came to us as equipment. We knew that the vehicle still had shortcomings. Noch Kinken hatte. Und das wurde auch umgerüstet in zwei Monaten noch. It was re-equipped in a further two months. The engines were changed and the gears were changed to an exhaust device to press the powdered gases out of the pipe. The pulverator couldn't manage that. And then began kurz the Ausbildung, as jeder Fahrer musste eine Fahrschule machen. Then came the training. Each driver had to pass the driving school. And when that was finished, that was in the last days of June, then head over hills there was transportation to Russia. Und meine Company, wir wurden am 4. Juli abends gegen Nachmittag in Front near. My company was leaving on the 4th of July in the evening. Towards the afternoon, we were unloaded near the front. In the evening, we had to line up in a wood. The whole regiment had to line up, and we were told what to expect and what we had to do. Da wurde uns gesagt, was wir zu erwarten haben und was wir durchführen sollten. Nach each individual company got its position for the attack. The companies, the columns, drove to their indicated positions according to the maps. 
That was quite close, perhaps two and a half kilometers. I have to add, you're extremely nervous before an attack. You smoke, you constantly need to go to the toilet. Not actually, but you feel like it. But when the battle starts, and it's the same when it's all over, everything falls by the wayside. You have to do your duty, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. Hitler's soldiers were not under any illusions. One who survived the ordeal, SS Lance Corporal Gunter Borchers of the Adolf Hitler Division, recorded his thoughts in his diary. I am in a flamethrowing team and we're to lead the company attack. This is a real suicide mission. We have to get to within 30 meters of the Russians before we open fire. It's time to write out the last will and testament. German plans, meanwhile, were no secret to Stavka, the Soviet Supreme High Command. Hitler's Supreme Command, a group of senior Wehrmacht officers, had for some time been feeding military secrets to Rudolf Rosler, a member of the Lucy spy ring operating from Switzerland, who in turn passed them on through his contacts to the Russians. The Russians had been watching the German movements of troops. They counted over 900,000 men, 2,700 tanks, 10,000 guns, 2,000 aircraft, with more following behind. In the Kremlin, Stavka, the Soviet high command, considered the options. The choice was to either strike first or let the Germans attack and then respond. Stalin decided to let the Germans throw themselves on the Russian guns. To meet the attack, Zhukov proposed an aggressive defense. He would force the Germans to make the first move against his carefully prepared positions. Then, once they were worn down, Soviet counteroffensives would follow. Within three months, half a million freight cars rolled into Kursk. Aware that the war on the Eastern Front had reached a critical stage and that the battle in the Kursk salient must be won, Zhukov committed 10 field armies, 40% of the Red Army's entire infantry and armored divisions to defend it. He also committed two tank armies and the Red Air Force. Together, the two fronts had more than 1.3 million men, 20,000 field guns and 3,500 tanks. They were supported by more than 2,650 aircraft. In reserve was a newly formed steppe front under General Ivan Koniev, with over 500,000 men, one more tank army and even more aircraft. The countryside over which the battle would be fought was lightly wooded and rolling, crossed by several rivers and deep ravines, most of which ran east to west, thus forming natural obstacles against the planned German assaults. Central Front Army Group under General Konstantin Rokozovsky would defend its northern side, while Voronezh Front under General Nikolai Vatutin would defend the south. Marshal Zhukov decided that the natural defenses were not enough. Starting in April, the Russians built successive belts of trenches protected by barbed wire and minefields. Von Manstein, commander of the German Army Group South, had not been enthusiastic about Hitler's plan. He suspected that the Soviet strength might be too great to overcome. Himmler arrived to inspect the pride of the SS, three divisions of them. The Lieb Standard, Das Reich, the Führer's own regiment, and the SS Panzer Division, Totenkopf, the Death's Head. On the northern salient stood the 4th Panzer Army, the most powerful force ever put under a single command in the history of the German army. Waiting for the moment, waiting for orders. More than half a million mines were laid in the first trench system alone. More artillery was massed in the open country between the trench systems. The work was completed by late June. On July the 2nd, Lucy warned Stavka that the German attack was imminent. In the early hours of July the 5th, Stavka passed the message on to the commanders in the field, and Zhukov let rip his long-prepared preemptive artillery barrage. The pre-dawn skies of southwestern Russia erupted in a fury of flame and thunder. It was 2.20 in the morning on Monday, July the 5th, 1943, and the massed German armies were taken by surprise. For it was not a German barrage that first thundered through the rain of the summer night. The Red Army, warned of the imminent German attack, had let loose their artillery first. The sheet of light burned from one side of the sky to the other. 
Flashes from heavy artillery sighted well behind the Russian front line created a distant flickering white light. Nearer guns produced a yellowish flare, while closest at hand, multi-barreled Katyusha launchers fired rockets, their flight marked by a trail of red flame. Tens of thousands of rockets screaming nerve-tearingly as they flew, crashed down hour after hour upon the German soldiers. The barrage reached its crescendo at dawn. The Germans, caught unawares, did not take long to respond. In the early hours, they returned fire with over a thousand of their guns. In the north, rain-soaked soldiers of Modell's 9th Army began to climb out of the shell-battered holes in which they'd crouched all night. Citadel had opened. Behind the infantry came tanks, while covering them overhead screamed Stuka dive bombers. German artillery, having recovered from the Soviet bombardment, let loose its own massive barrage, which consumed in a few hours more shells than the Germans had used in both the Polish and French Blitzkrieg campaigns put together. The German foot soldiers fought their way across the minefields and through the barbed wire to the first Russian trench lines. Using hand grenades and machine pistols, they advanced on each trench and dugout. Already it was proving an exceptionally bloody and ferocious struggle. In the afternoon of July the 5th, the Germans launched their first wave, some 2,000 tanks. Their firepower and mobility were even greater than the earlier blitzkriegs across Europe. But greater still was the strength of the Russians laying in wait. It was carnage not seen since the battles of the First World War. Author Horst Scheibert was a company commander in the reserve tank army at the time of the Battle of Kursk. Basically, we fought in exactly the same way in 1939 as in 1943, like in the campaign in Poland. That's the old education we'd been given in peacetime. The platoon consisted of five tanks in two groups and the leader vehicle. And these two groups consisted each of two tanks which fought together, observed each other and helped each other. They gave each other signals, you stop, protect me with fire, I'm proceeding as far as the next undulation and so on. The platoon leader observed two groups and gave his commands. The big advantage of the German tank corps was that from the beginning, in 1943, all the big tanks had radio, and later radio and transmitters. On the battlefield, we could talk to each other just as we're talking now. The radio was so good that I could understand from the voice just who it was, without him mentioning his name. Just as in the family, you know who's talking in the room next door. That was a great advantage. One German soldier recalled, it seemed as if we were advancing into a ring of flame. With less than only half a kilometer covered in the first advance, many of the German tanks were being picked off by the Russian artillery. 
Others floundered in the minefields. Those that escaped ran the gauntlet of even heavier Russian batteries. One German tank commander later stated, we'd been warned to expect resistance, but never had I seen before such an overwhelming strength of Russian numbers as on that day. A few Porsche Tigers broke through the Russian defenses in small groups, but the new Panther tanks were less successful. Everywhere they were hounded by the Soviet infantry. The Red Army's chief of staff, Marshal Georgi Zukov, was known throughout the army as being a tough man and not one to show mercy in war. But it transpired later that even he, the hardened warrior, felt sorry for those that had been on the receiving end of his army's barrage. He wrote later, we all felt and heard the hurricane of fire and imagined the frightening picture on the enemy side, pressed to the earth to escape the furious hell of bombs and shells. In those first few hours of the battle, the Russians had used up half their total supply of shells. Everybody is afraid before an attack. When the attack starts, you don't think about it anymore. You lose that feeling of fear and you get on with your job. And that's about all you think about. We knew approximately, we didn't know exactly, but we knew there were at least a third more men. And concerning tanks, we knew they had at least 50% more than us. We were told what to expect, how many there were going to be, only we weren't told what a terrible counterattack would take place. The fury of Modell's assault shook the Russians, though the bravery of the Russian infantry succeeded in holding it at first. Then two Red Army divisions crumbled under German panzer attacks. Fearing a breakthrough, Rokossovsky ordered massive barrages of artillery fire. These enabled his infantry, backed by brigades of anti-tank guns, to block the German thrust. During the first day, Modell's men, for all their courage and determination, advanced little more than six and a half kilometers. In the south, meanwhile, Hoth's men had faced similar conditions. The defenses were equally as strong and ferocious. The infantry were faced with endless rows of trenches and minefields. The farthest advance made by any of Hoth's troops on the first day was 12 kilometers. Moreover, some 65 kilometers of the 225 that still separated the northern and southern prongs of the German pincers were covered with the same kind of obstacles and defended by the same caliber of men who fought so furiously during the first day of the battle. It was a fearful prospect. Both German generals remarked on the skill of the Red Army commanders, and regimental officers reported the improved abilities of the Russian rank and file. Intensive Russian training in the preceding months was paying off. The Red Air Force was equally impressive. The mighty Luftwaffe fought to retain superiority in the air over the battlefields. The dive bombers pounded the Russian defenses. Deadly new fragmentation bombs scattered over the anti-tank positions, causing the Russian troops to dive for cover. But everywhere the Luftwaffe attacked, their strength was not allowed by the Russians to become a decisive factor in the war. Russian fighters of the Red Air Force hit back hard, but their losses were high. 432 Russian planes were shot down. The Luftwaffe also lost a staggering 173 aircraft. Despite superiority in the air, German progress remained painfully slow. By the end of the first ferocious day, the Germans had lost 25,000 men and hundreds of tanks, and they were still bogged down in the first line of the Soviet defenses. When they reached the second line, they found it was stronger still. On the southern flank of the salient, where the 48th Panzer Corps and the three SS Panzer divisions were attacking, the fighting was even fiercer.
The spearhead managed to dent the Russian defenses, their first light of a possible success. Under a barrage of intense fire, the SS divisions were forced to spend the first night of the battle in swamps. As the darkness came and night fell over the field of battle, the troops were not allowed to rest. The battle raged on both sides just as fierce as it had been during the daylight. The sun rose at 4 a.m. on the 6th of July, the second day of the battle, and with it came the Russian fighters. They threw in every available bomber and ground attack aircraft to hit the German tanks. All through the second day, the German forces attacked the heavy Russian defenses, wave after wave of tanks and infantry. In the south, despite the Russian efforts, the force and might of the German attack tore a gap in General Chityarkov's army, and through this gap, von Manstein threw his reserves. In the north, two of the SS divisions clawed their way forward to gain almost seven kilometers. The reserve armies were brought up to the front to increase the effort for a big breakthrough. Modell had originally planned to hold these until the final drive into Kursk after his infantry had broken through Central Front's defences. But seeing a gap beginning to open, he changed tactics and committed the major elements of his armoured forces. But even with the additional strength of the reserve army, they were still going to have to slog their way through, metre by bloody metre, through clumps of dug-in Russian T-34 tanks, vast batteries of anti-tank guns, and hundreds of deadly minefields. The hardship got worse, and the time was running out. By the 9th of July, the battle having been raging for five days and nights, the German advance was gradually making progress. In the south, they took the town of Okopigny, a damaged bridge across the river Pena was seized. The 4th Army Panzers were by now within 16 kilometers of Obiyan, from where they'd be able to join the main road into Kursk. It seemed briefly the Russian defences were by now weakening and that the situation might be improving for the Germans. But in the north, it was a different story. The army detachment Kempf was held by the Russians in deep, stronger defences. As a result, it had not been able to offer support to protect the right flank of Hoth's forces. Hoth, unable to make any way northwards, had switched his thrust east towards the village of Prokhorovka. With the assistance of Stuka bombers attacking the Russian ground defences from the air, Hoth's crack SS, Das Reich and Totenkopf divisions captured their first objectives, two hills on the road to Prokhorovka. The history of Das Reich Division records that the attack went smoothly, almost as if on manoeuvres. There was a general feeling that the Russian opposition was beginning to weaken. The road to deploy had been cleared by 20th Panzer Division, but losses were mounting heavily on both sides.
The defences of Tuploi were bombarded by German guns. The Russians pulled back out of the village and regrouped in the surrounding hills. Twice the advancing Germans took the hills, twice they were thrown back by Soviet counterattacks. Then there was a third attempt, and the 33rd Panzer Grenadier Regiment, with its last remaining officer, retook the ridge before being driven back once again. The 18th and 9th Panzer Divisions clawed their way into the village of Pondry, meeting the most fearsome resistance, but Russian losses were beginning to mount. By the night of the 11th of July, the German forces had driven a bulge into the Russian front. Despite the tremendous efforts of the Russians both on the ground and in the air, it looked as though they were once again in appalling danger. Citadel had reached the moment of decision and the massive German breakthrough might come at any moment. That night, however, it was to change. Zukov released his reserves. The 5th Guards Army and the 5th Guard Armoured Force, a confident and fresh new army with full ammunition base. The next day was to bring about a battle that would fly clean in the face of German tactical doctrine. That in a blitzkrieg offensive, the purpose of panzers is to exploit an enemy weakness, not to fight tank versus tank. Germans in the north brought out every tank that would run and began their last final drive. The Russians had drawn on every reserve they had, regardless of the situation elsewhere. The main Russian battle tank, the T-34, faced heavier German equipment with the Tigers and Panthers, but whilst the German tanks could outgun the Russians, they were slower and their half-empty fuel tanks could be set afire with ease. The T-34s were faster, more maneuverable, and more numerous. Both sides were ready and eager to inflict the heaviest damage possible on the enemy. Through the hot morning of July the 12th, the two mighty armies closed in on each other for what was to become one of the most terrible armored encounters of all time. Horst Scheibert describes how the Russian tanks compared to the German tanks. The Panzer can man vergleichen einmal nach. Well, you can compare the tanks with regard to the strength of the armor plating, to the weapon, to the weight, and as a result, the so-called horsepower to weight ratio. That means how much horsepower you have per ton. There should be at least 15 horsepower for each ton. Anything below that is just a completely tired crow on the battlefield. Everything above that is a snappy tank. The tanks of today, modern tanks in general, have 27 horsepower per ton, whereas the Tiger had only 10. The Tiger was a very limp bird on the battlefield, which also had a lot of teething problems. In legend, because it was the last big tank, it had weak points. The T-34 had, like the Panther, 15 horsepower per ton. That means it was normal. 15 PS per ton. That means it was normal. The Panzer IV had 10 horsepower. It was also weaker. The Panzer IV had 10 horsepower. It was also weaker. And the Panther had also 15. I think I already said that. Then there is still the ground pressure, how many kilograms per square centimeter, how much weight of the chain is on the ground, that is important. If the tank goes through wet terrain, this determines whether you get stuck somewhere or whether you move well. At first, the Russians had very wide chains. Wider chains can bear more weight. So they had a very important width-weight ratio. The Germans had altogether two narrow chains, which were completely useless in swampy ground. 
We had much wider chains for the Taiga, with the result that it couldn't get through a tunnel or go over a railway bridge or that the oncoming traffic had to be stopped. When they couldn't be transported, they had devised so-called loading chains, which had to be put on before transport by train so that the chains didn't get caught somewhere when they were transported by rail. The Tiger, in turn, was so heavy that the horsepower-to-weight ratio was unfavorable, as was its pressure on the ground in relation to kilograms per square centimeter. And then, of course, the range. The range was significantly higher for the Russian than for the German tanks. The Tiger only had a range of 100 kilometers, then his fuel was used up. And the T-36 had a range of 600 kilometers. It ran on diesel, whereas we used petrol. And on account of that, we always had weaknesses, also with the German tanks as regards the driving range at the time. Near Prokhorovka, all was set for the largest clash of tanks ever assembled. But meanwhile, the Russians had another card to play, a massive all-out air attack on the German forces below. As night came, the 17th Air Army's 213th Night Bomber Air Division, along with reinforcements from the 313th Night Bomber Air Division from the 15th Air Army, attacked the northern sector. The air was filled with a steady roar as waves of Soviet bombers and their fighter escorts maintaining rigid formation flew over the battlefield, directing their bombs onto where the German tank and artillery emplacements were concentrated. The raids continued all night. They flew no less than 362 sorties against the Germans, dropping 210 tons of bombs. On the ground, the Russian batteries also continued throughout the night, pounding away at the German forces. As dawn broke, yet another airstrike was launched. The skies were filled with Stukas and Schlacht aircraft battling it out in the dogfights involving up to 150 aircraft at any time. One Luftwaffe pilot, in spite of having to force land on five separate occasions, managed to score an amazing 12 victories. Another scored 11. Air superiority was definitely in favor of the Luftwaffe. Russian aircraft losses were enormous. But no sooner had they lost a hundred than another hundred fresh aircraft would be in the air, hurling themselves relentlessly against the battle-weary German pilots. A staggering 72 separate air battles were recorded, involving an amazing total of 2,174 sorties flown by pilots going up as many as six times throughout the morning. In the south, a further 200 aircraft were sent up to keep Hauser's Panzer spearheads at bay. Up until this time, throughout the whole air campaign for the Battle of Kursk, the Luftwaffe had flown a staggering 37,421 sorties, destroying 1,735 enemy aircraft. 20,000 tons of bombs have been dropped, and over 1,100 enemy tanks and 1,300 vehicles have been destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Coupled with a concentrated fire from the artillery, these attacks held the tank battle below at bay. However, it was 
short-lived, as just before noon on the 12th of July, the two armies met head-on as the German tanks tried desperately for a big breakthrough. This was the Clash of the Titans. The largest tank battle in the history of warfare had begun. The future of Hitler's war on the Eastern Front now lay in the success or failure of this mammoth armored brawl. Martin Langer recalls that day. The Russians got stronger and stronger. I can only say that I have never seen anything like the engagement of masses of tanks, artillery and aeroplanes, the condensed masses that ran at each other. I'll never forget as long as I live the Battle of Kursk-Bogen. Other episodes during the war, well, there were hard days, but something like that never happened again. When I think of this battle, I don't like to think of this battle, it was murderous. Quite frankly, there was no mercy, not from either side. From the moment the leading elements of Soviet armor crashed through the SS Panzer Corps, first echelon, the commanders of both sides lost all control of their formations, and the battle became a confused free-for-all in which every tank and its crew fought individually amidst a packed mass of armor like knights on a 15th century battlefield. In this colossal drama, fighting was almost at point-blank range. The Tigers lost all advantage of armor and armament, which they enjoyed of the T-34s at long range. From the smoke and dust which enveloped the battlefield spurted huge flashes of flame as ammunition exploded aboard stricken tanks, sending their turrets wailing through the air as they separated from the shattered hulls. Tanks collided, rammed each other, locked together in a most fearsome struggle. The Russian Second Guards and Second Tank Corps broke into the woods west of Belichino and the farms east of the village of Kilinin. In the center of the Russian line, 18th and 29th Tank Corps were slugging it out with the Liebstandart, the spearhead of the German attack. The impact of the Russian armor, its machines fresh, unworn and fully armed, darting into the Hauser's battle-weary divisions, knocked the momentum out of the German advance. On the north flank, Totenkopf fought a series of close-quarter tank and infantry engagements with the 31st Tank and 33rd Guards Rifle Corps. No mercy was shown by the Russians to the men of the SS division that fell into their hands. Their death's head insignia was a virtual death warrant. Overhead, the Red Air Force continued to bomb the artillery emplacements. The 
big guns on both sides sent barrages of flames and smoke through the air. There was going to be no reprise from either side. This was a fight to the finish. On their right flank, Rodmistrov's 2nd Guards tank corps slammed into Das Reich. By mid-afternoon, a crisis flared up for the Russians. On Rodmistrov's right flank, the 18th tank corps was coming under heavy pressure. The 5th Guards Army, which had no tanks and was by now weak in artillery, was also threatening to give way as German tanks broke through two of its infantry divisions. Rodmistrov now committed the remainder of his army, the remaining reserves, to secure the breach and forcing the advancing Germans to go on the defensive. In fact, by late afternoon, after a series of attacks and counterattacks, both sides were locked in a stalemate of defensive action. As the darkness fell over the battle, the rocket barrage continued, screaming through the skies in huge ripples of flame. Most of the German troops were in despair. Their hard-earned expertise was proving near useless in the chaos of close-range battles. Their dismay was matched at Hitler's headquarters, where news had come through of Allied landings in Sicily two days before. Hitler decided he had no choice but to withdraw the three SS Panzer divisions from the salient to reinforce his armies in Italy. But the Russians did not relent. They now launched Operation Kutuzov, the Soviet counteroffensive. The Germans went on the retreat, hampered continuously by the Russian pursuit. The Red Army rolled out of the salient towards Oral, confident and victorious. But the victory was not without cost. Germany could derive some comfort from the fact that although defeated in this battle, they had inflicted major damage on the Russian army and its reserve force. Although this was not felt by some in Hitler's high command. One wrote, after the bloody struggle for Stalingrad, there followed an equally bloody struggle for Kursk. It was intended to exhaust Russia's last forces at a strategically important point. Citadel, however, swallowed even more of our own divisions in this ever more horrifying whirlpool. Although the German army was badly battle-beaten, tired and demoralized, they had no plans to surrender to the Russians. They fought on relentlessly. German losses had been high, although not as high as the Russians. 4th Panzer Army had lost some 330 tanks, 3rd Panzer Division was down to only 30 tanks. In total, during the battle, Germany lost 645 tanks and 207 assault guns. Compared to Russia's losses of 1,500 tanks, almost half the force had started the battle with, the figures seemed low in comparison. But Russian production was keeping well ahead of its losses, enabling the Red Army to remorselessly complete its complement of armoured vehicles and artillery. In the immediate aftermath of Kursk, the Soviet formations, which had borne the brunt of the onslaught, had been seriously weakened. But the power of the Red Army continued to grow, drawing on an almost limitless force of six and a half million men, with a further half a million still in reserve. Supported by the Red Air Force, the Red Army continued gathering momentum in driving the Germans back. One German commander, Major General von Melenthin, remarked, we're now in the position of a man who has seized a wolf by the ears and dare not let him go. By now, the Germans understood the nature of the Russian soldier. Von Melenthin also remarked that the Russian soldier is immune to the most incredible hardships. 
and does not even seem to notice them. He's equally indifferent to bombs and shells. This was not the same Russian soldier we faced a year ago. Withdrawing from the relentless Soviet pressure, the German forces destroyed everything behind them, leaving nothing that could be turned against them or used by the pursuing Russians. They laid fields with mines, blew up the railroads and destroyed the bridges, yet still the Russians kept on coming. On the 17th of July, the Soviets launched a powerful attack in the south along the Mayas line. They fielded five fresh infantry armies, two mechanized corps, three tank brigades, and a cavalry corps. There was yet another fierce and bloody battle. In the area around Orel, Modell's army was now facing a second Stalingrad as the Russians raced to cut off his escape. With around 600,000 men, he had to smash his way through Kutuzov's army, only just managing to avoid complete encirclement and reach the comparative safety of the Hagen line. The battle was lost and the fault was Hitler's, for it was his delays that had allowed the Russians to prepare their defenses and train their men. Conceived, planned and executed by the heirs of the great general staff, Citadel had been a complete failure. A war of machines had been sought at Kursk in the full knowledge that the attacking forces were inferior in numbers to the enemy and that there were insufficient reserves to exploit any chance of success when the opportunity had allowed. The operation seemed to have been planned on the assumption by Hitler that the Russians would collapse at the first impact. Little thought had been given to what might happen if they did not, although Modell had warned of the consequences. For when the enemy fails to disintegrate, the dash and aura of invincibility was no longer going to be enough. German intelligence at every stage, especially in the lack of knowledge as to the strength of Russia's army and their fortifications and defenses, and the masterly placing and handling of the Russian strategic reserve had ensured the failure of Citadel. The collapse of Citadel marked the turning point of World War II. The operation may not have been, as Soviet writers later claimed, the swan song of the German panzer arm. Nor did the Russian victory at Kursk break completely the offensive power of the German war machine, but it did wrest the strategic initiative from the Germans. The Hauptgrundfehler is, nach meiner Ansicht, der Ansatz. The main basic mistake was, in my opinion, in the setting of the starting point. That is, the Russians, for a quarter of a year, had been able to see how the tanks had been put into formation on the German side. They also had reconnaissance. It might have been German prisoners, civilians who'd been infiltrated, or the people who lived in the villages there, or by air reconnaissance. Behind that, counter-attack units had been placed. They let us fight a bit and got us tired in the position areas and also sometimes in the minefields. The attack day had been postponed again and again. The secret of where the push was going to take place, the big push, or where the combined pincer pushes were to take place, the Russians had also known that for a long time and had built relevant deep trench systems on their side. You mustn't imagine that there were minefields kilometers long, but at the most important passes, mines were laid between the Balkans, for instance. Sometimes you could not recognize them because they were newly laid, and of course you couldn't see them in the night. We lost a lot of tanks and men in those minefields. But to say exactly what the main mistake was, the German side should have, in retrospect, you're always wiser, but the Germans should have let the Russians accumulate. There were strong units on the German side to hold back, and when the Russians broke through, they should have done with the Russians what the Russians later did with us, by cutting off the penetrating units. That would have been more productive.
das hätte mehr gebracht. Ja, der Abbruch der Schlacht, das hat man uns hinterher gesagt, war... We were told afterwards that the breakup of the battle was caused by the landing in Sicily, and then they pulled out the SS divisions, which had also carried out the main burden of the attacks. When they'd gone, we were left practically alone. All that was left was a few tank divisions of the army and an infantry division. With such a small force, there's nothing you can do against tanks. Then came the terrific push by the Russians. Everybody was badly beaten, badly battle beaten. What touches you very strongly was the death of many comrades. And that is something you can never forget in your lifetime. Und das kann man im Leben nie vergessen. Thank you.